Uh, good evening, uh, delegates. As we come to the last session, it's an interesting session on a fracture that we commonly treat, the tibial plateau fractures. And it is my pleasure to invite the faculty. Dr. Tushar Ubale is the co-convener for this session with me. May I first invite the chairpersons, Dr. Subhash Devre and Dr. Eknath Pawar, to please come and chair the session. I'll then briefly call the faculty, uh, we, apart from myself and Tushar, we have Dr. Prashant Agarwal, we have Dr. Sachin Bhosle, we have Dr. Vivek Trikha, and Dr. Rajiv Rao Chaudhary. Can I please ask all of you to come on stage? And I'll hand over to Tushar to start the session. Good evening, everybody. I'd like to invite our first speaker, Dr. Prashant Agarwal, for moving beyond Shajgar, the newer city-based classifications of proximal tibia fracture. Dr. Prashant Agarwal. Good evening. <coughs> At the outset, let me thank Bombay Orthopedic Society and Vairoc team for giving me this opportunity to <coughs> discuss about classifications of tibial condylar fractures. As you know, tibial condyle is very uh, complex structure and if you see two-dimensional and three-dimensional views, then there is a lot of difference between two-dimensional imaging and three-dimensional imaging. X-rays will give you two-dimensional image of a tibial condyle where we are not going to see much on the posterior condyle or part of the tibial condyle. So three-dimensional CT scan or two-dimensional CT scan will give you overview of the anatomy of tibial condyle which will help us in planning the treatment. Now this definitely characterize the fracture pattern of a tibial condyle which will help us in deciding the treatment protocols. Simultaneously we can compare the various management plans associated with the tibial condylar fracture. So understanding of anatomy of fracture will make your, very, your life very easy so you can navigate the treatment plan in the better way. Old standard treat, uh, classification, Shaksgar classification type 1, 2 and 3 basically involves the lateral condyle of a tibia and type 4 is a medial condyle and type 4 and 5 is a bicondylar 5 and 6 is a bicondylar fracture, but this is based mainly on the two-dimensional imaging where AP and lateral views are taken and this cla being classified. Now 3D CT scan or a 2D CT scan will give you more information about the anatomy of a fracture or a tibial condyle and we can have a better outlook or better view about the posterior condyle. Now, 2D, this is an image of a proximal tibia where this is a constructed from the CT scan where three-dimensional uh, 3D CT picture is being made and uh, the fracture involved in this particular area can nicely be visualized. Now, Leo's has classified into three column and later on modified into four column where three means anterior, post, uh, medial, lateral and posterior column. Later, posterior was again divided into two posterior medial and posterior lateral. This is basically to have a information about the fracture lines. This is how it's being planned on the 3D image of a CT scan where you can divide them into various quadrants. Now there is a concept of zero column fracture. It is like say only central depression where periphery or rim of the condyle is intact and here management will be totally different. This is uh, can better be visualized in the three-dimensional imaging. Now these are various examples of a column where one column means only one condyle, two column means both condyles or a posterior portion is affect involved. Basically information will help you in planning the treatment approach and in planning the implant so you can give a better outcome. In three column where all the three columns are involved, both anterior and one posterior. These are again images showing you various involvement of various condyle and combination. Here you need to plan your approach accordingly. Lot of classification has been devised, uh, has been described in the literature. 
now yaws in 2018 they have divided it into 10 segments that nine segment that will see the shagsgas old classification was modified in 2018 based taking into help of a ct scan and which is again a keystone and that gives you very good information about your uh, fracture pattern this modified shagsgas classification is basically it incorporates the old classification and also take into account the 3d imaging and will help you which 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 will give you fair idea about the various <laughs> various uh, involvement of various condyles and placement and and your fracture pattern here the equator or a line joining fibular head anterior margin and posterior portion of a medial collateral ligament is being attached this is called virtual equator which divides into anterior and posterior segment again by imaginary line in the center of a tibia tibial condyle you can divide them into four quadrants similar to what leos did this again these four quadrants are important in planning because all four approaches can be uh, uh, used for fixation of four condyles like posterior anterior posterior medial or posterior lateral based on your anatomy of a fracture now these again uh, quadrants are anterior lateral quadrant anterior medial posterior lateral and posterior lateral quadrant now if you see into uh, metaphyseal extension then there are various labelings like you have type 1 or 2 or 3 it's similar to your uh, old classification of shagsgar but you have to add a small letter a and for anterior antero anterolateral and antero medial and for posterior you again add up letter p similarly for distal extension in the metaphysis we add a letter x like ax means your meta it is extending down into the metaphysis anteriorly so it gives you a three dimensional view or orientation of a fracture line extending even into the metaphysis this is a simple split fracture where there is a fracture line extending in the anterior quadrant this is a the fracture line is in the seen in the posterior column or posterior quadrant of a tibial condyle and posteriorly it is extending down on the posterior side and this is labeled as a px now this is how this particular classification helps you in deciding the treatment here the posterior medial quadrant is affected you take a approach and you reach that particular site and you just use a plate in the buttressing mode and you can reduce and stabilize the fracture this is how its classification will help you in deciding the treatment plan when there is involvement of two quadrants again you have to take here the lat posterior lateral and anterior quad antero lateral quadrant uh, quadrant showing a fracture line which is extending down in the metaphysis this is one example where you have a 2a type of fracture which is extending into the lateral side this is a only a, uh, a pure depression type like a zero class zero of lucas this is again a 2a plus p that means 2a it's a or, old original two split depression anterior and extending into posterior this is another classification this is important because in center you have important vital structures like tibial spine you have attachment of cruciates where these are important uh, part of a knee joint and which gives you stability so this medial segment or quadrant is also important and that we have to take into account when planning the treatment for condylar fractures another classification which was described for especially related to the medial tibial condyle and it is useful because type 1 2 and 3 c type is involvement of fracture line extending on the lateral side and this is important because this particular type of fracture is associated with uh, the neurovascular complications and which needs to be kept in mind when you have of this fracture pattern dr prashant i think we need to summarize now yeah sometimes we have to do a ct angio and magnetic imaging based on the particular case Thank you very much for you. Again good evening everybody. As the name suggests throwing the light onto the dark corner of the knee approaches for the posterior lateral corner fractures. 
so we will be mainly concentrating on the posterior lateral corner approaches a la carte different load different roads lead to the same destination choosing the best approach uh, for the proximal tibia fracture these are the some standard approaches i'm sure everybody knows standard anteromedial posteromedial anterolateral uncommon posterior posterolateral extensile anterior midline and there are few osteotomy based approaches like gerdes tubercle osteotomy proximal fibular osteotomy lateral epicondyle and tibial tuberosity why you need to know different approaches because as uh, the highlighted by the previous uh, speaker the column concept and the fragments so certain fragments can be reduced well only with the specific approach again column specific fixation then as it is very common in proximal tibia often the skin condition dictates the choice of the approach then combinations and then interference with future tkr incision so all this we have to keep in mind to select the proper approach and why posterior lateral corner as everybody knows it is called the dark corner of the knee because of the difficult surgical access and the anatomical barriers like fibula head and the various ligaments so these are the common approaches for posterior lateral corner of the knee extensile anterolateral lateral epicondylar osteotomy gerdes tubercle osteotomy and suprafibular approach when when we choose any of these when there is concomitant anterior fracture along with the posterior or posterior lateral fracture extensive metadiaphyseal extension and depressed fracture of the posterior central and posterior lateral quadrants then direct posterior lateral with osteotomy these are classical proximal fibular osteotomy then modified modification by solomon then direct posterior lateral that everybody knows frosh and modified frosh and tau approach so this is the most commonly used approach anterolateral approach as you can see s shape incision can run anterior posterior to gerdes tubercle as per the fracture anatomy Ele uh, involves elevation of iliotibial band posterior retraction of the dorsiflexion and submeniscal arthrotomy this was modified by sherney and johnson how you deal with the it band because the traditional dealing with the it band allows limited visualization of the lateral and posterior and central plateau hence the modification was anterior half of the itb is stenotomized and the gt to gerdes tubercle is osteotomized and taken laterally and rotated externally which improves the, which um, uh, improves the access to the lateral central and posterior lateral plateau immensely and the gerdes osteotomized gerdes tubercle is again replaced back anatomically below the plate or can be fixed separately with the screws this is a example where this approach has been used now this lateral epicondylar osteotomy is reported by 2005 by, by yun yc these are very recent approaches it involves lateral parapatellar approach and arthrotomy with the knee flexion identify the lateral epicondyle with attachment of popliteus and lcl then we osteotomize the lateral epicondyle and it's flip laterally as you can see in this picture this is the case example by the original author where this approach was used the advantages are give improved visualization of the posterior lateral corner can be done by extending the standard anterolateral approach the first approach i showed we can uh, that can be extended to do this osteotomy disadvantages dissection and morbidity to the distal femur and arthrotomy this is one very good new approach that is suprafibular approach introduced by who sj in 2015 employs interval between lateral collateral ligament and lateral posterior lateral tibial rim so patient is in lateral decubit decubitus position oblique incision from gerdes tubercle to the tip of the fibula 60 degree knee flexion exploits the interval between as we are seen in the previous fracture inter interval between rim of the posterior lateral rim of the tibia and the lateral collateral ligament then standard submeniscal arthrotomy whole lateral posterior lateral rim is visualized as can seen in the picture and the plating can be done here at the uh, example classical posterior and posterior lateral depression fixed uh, with the raft plate you can see the screws are going real posteriorly 
that is the advantage of this approach another case here the horizontal plate is used they are coming with newer plates to especially complying with this fracture you can get real posterior screw access as seen in the post op ct so advantages good access to complete posterior lateral rim avoids complicated posterior lateral approaches involving neurovascular structures and avoids prone position so that can be easily combined with the medial approach if needed limitation cannot address shear fractures only limited for depressed purely depressed fracture limited ability to handle central fragment risk to uh, lateral collateral ligament and special plates are needed as shown this so they are nowadays coming with this kind of plates specially to for this approach thank you i invite next speaker dr sachin bosle hello friends thank you bos for calling me here uh, i am going to talk about goals of osteosynthesis in tbl plateau fractures so uh, first uh, many of the tbl plateau fractures they come up with lot of swelling so it's important to manage the swelling check the compartment check for any other soft tissue injuries and if there is lot of swelling it's uh, good to put a temporary knee fixator along with some bias etc and let the swelling settle down till you get a opportunity to safely operate on the patient uh, not too early not too late this is one of the examples here so our basic goals is plan plan properly what type of fracture it is we have to get it right first time tbl plateau fractures wrongly done and uh, it fails it's a big uh, problem to sort it out and uh, even afterwards it may not be a easy total knee replacement so first goal is basically to restore the articular congruity to get the joint surface back to where it was second is assess the need for bone grafting if it is required third is to restore the limb alignment the fixation should be stable so that the patient can be mobilized early and it's important to identify associated soft tissue injuries like a mcl rupture or any meniscal tears or entrapments basic goals further on is early mobilization of the patient along with protected weight bearing correct follow up x rays restore joint function so that osteoarthritis is avoided uh now we have moved from 2d to 3d shatzger presented the first classification of his around 1974 and 2018 fury uh, modified the classification along with shatzger and uh, they took into consideration 2d and 3d views so a shatzger type 1 fracture is straightforward and perhaps the only fracture amenable to percutaneous fixation of cancellous screws alone we must check in the ct if the fragment is anterior or posterior type 2 fracture is a split, a split depression and uh, it might need a graft not always in young uh, young patients bone sometimes is good enough not to put a graft that's one of the example but it's important to see whether the fragment is anterior or posterior if ct is not available intraoperative oblique views are really useful to assess where actually your fracture is a type 3 fracture is a pure depression type of fracture of the lateral plateau it's often seen in the osteoporotic type of patients and elevation of the fracture accurately is important and raft screws with or without bone graft are useful a type 4 fracture is a medial uh, condyle fracture never fix it with cancellous screws alone there is always associated instability fixation with cancellous screws alone with fail so one has to check whether the fracture is posterior or anterior and fixation is done with plates that's one of the examples of a medial tibial plateau fracture not exactly a shatzger four fracture because there is some extension on the lateral side uh, really nasty it was almost a dislocated knee and uh, that is how i managed it there was one small lateral fix fixed with a k wire but a posterior medial plate did the job restored the congruity of the fracture quite well 
Schatzger type 5 and 6 are bicondylar fracture, but difference between 5 and 6 is metaphysi or diaphysial disjunction happens in 6. Always do a MRI scan in Schatzger type 5 and 6 fractures. Plan the approaches beforehand. Check collaterals and the menisci. That's an example of something which I recently did. This patient had a really nasty Schatzger 5 or 6 fracture. Uh, he took about a week for a swelling to settle down. That is how I managed it. I used simultaneous collateral approaches, medial and lateral. First got the continuity right uh, with a medial wire. Next I put, uh, restored the lateral articular congruity. Put two plates on, there was a void. Then I put some bone graft on, put two plates, clamped the plates together with that pointed tooth clamp and completed the fixation, restoring reasonable articular congruity. Schatzger type 6 fracture may require a dual, might require two plates medially, one plate laterally. The difference between 5 and 6 is 6 has got two main areas of instability, one at the tibial plateau, other one is a metaphyseo diaphysial junction and uh, both of these need to be addressed. That's one of the examples, not exactly Schatzger 6, but we can see that, that there is a fracture in the upper shaft and crushed lateral tibial plateau. Quite a nasty injury. The lady came with huge amount of swelling. She was not a young lady. She had Parkinson's and they did not know she had fractured the limb till she developed blisters. I initially put a spanning fixator with two K wires, restore the articular congruity and after a month when she settled down completely, I put a lateral locking plate. Uh, no bone graft. Thanks a lot. Good evening. So with better understanding of the fracture patterns, we've come to realize that the conventional approaches and techniques are not useful in a large percentage of these tibial plateau fractures. And so newer techniques and approaches have to be devised. The principles, however, remain the same. You want the articular surface to be perfect. You want to buttress the metaphysis. You want to restore the length, rotation and alignment of the diaphysis. Every fractured column has to be stabilized and fixed. And do this with a minimum of soft tissue disruption. A number of uh, decisions have to be made based on these factors and making the correct decision is imperative to ensure a successful outcome. The timing of surgery is as always decided by the state of your soft tissues. These are high energy injuries. There will be considerable soft tissue swelling, blister formation. So any internal fixation has to be deferred till your soft tissues have settled so as to minimize your risk of wound breakdowns or infections. Surgical approaches, we already had Dr. Tushar telling us how newer approaches have been done. What is important is that every column that we see on this CT classification that is fractured needs to be addressed and hence choose your approach that will allow you the best uh, access to these columns. You may need more than one approach to fix all the fractures that are there. And based on which approaches you want to do, you will have to position your patients Conventionally, we used to do these patients in the supine position. This gives a great access to the anterior half of the tibial plateau. But if you have an associated posterior fractures, then it's a total different ball game. The posterior medial column can still be assessed by keeping the leg in a figure of four position. But if you have an associated posterior lateral fracture, it is virtually impossible to do in the supine position. An alternative is a prone position if you, which will give excellent access to the posterior half of the tibia. You can fix your posterior medial and posterior lateral fractures. Another advantage is because your knee remains in extension, these fractures are easier to reduce. And a posterior plate with posterior to anterior screws is biomechanically stronger than trying to fix these posterior fractures from the front. But the trouble occurs if there is an associated anterior fracture for which you have no access in the prone position. So if you have an associated anterior fracture, you have to do a staged approach where you finish the posterior job first, then turn the patient, re-drape and access the anterior. 
the big problem here is that should you have a, any degree of mal alignment when you fixed your posterior fractures it will interfere with your reduction and fixation of the anterior fractures and you don't have access to go and uh, redo that because you've already changed the position so in such when you have anterior and posterior associated fractures my choice of positioning would be the floating or the floppy lateral position which will allow you to go back and front by turning the patient and allows you to access all the four columns simultaneously so that you can move from front to back as need be to get a perfect reduction the sequence of fixation depends obviously on the fracture pattern that you're dealing with but as a general rule the medial side because it is hard bone you have a split fracture with minimum combination and it's easier to reduce also once you've reduced that you restore the joint height which can then serve as a reference for which to how, how much to elevate the depressed lateral column fractures there are number of implants which have been now devised which can be column specific these are anatomically contoured locking implants which make your job very easy but not all fractures require these expensive implants and if you have only a posterior fractures i prefer to use a non lock 1/3 uh, the 3.5 mm distal radial plates so the choice of the implant will depend on what kind of fracture that you are dealing with if it's a split or a shear fragment which requires the compression or buttressing even a non lock conventional implant will just do the job but if you have somebody where you need to elevate a depressed fragment and support it with rafting screws or if you have a metaphyseal diaphyseal combination which needs to be bridged then the angular stable fixation provided by the lock plates are a better option just not choosing the right plate but placing it in the right position is equally important there is sometimes a temptation to try and fix everything with a single lateral plate most of the times if you have a coronal posterior medial fragment your lateral plate will not allow fixation of this fragments because the trajectory of screws will not reach that fragment so you need to have a separate medial plate there may be a confusion where to put the medial plate should it be put medially should it be put posteriorly so you need to assess what kind of a fracture you are dealing with if the apex of the fracture exits on the medial anteromedial surface of the tibia is it exiting on the posterior surface of the tibia or do you have a combination of both because accordingly you will have to put a medial plate a posterior medial plate or maybe use dual plates both medially as well as posteriorly these are intraarticular fractures and you need to start early range of motion exercises as we have already said you need to defer weight bearing by about 6 weeks and but if you have to had a posterior fracture fixed there's a tendency for these patients to develop a fixed flexion deformity so you need to be very vigilant maybe use a posterior knee brace as we use in a total knee replacement to try and avoid that in summary these are inherently unstable fractures they are difficult to fix by conventional approaches each involved column needs to be reduced and stabilized and i would say that you need to master operating in this floppy lateral or floating position and using the posterior medial reversed l incision and the anterolateral incision as you can virtually treat any of the fractures of the tibial plateau with these thank you thank you may i invite dr vivek trikha to deliver his next lecture thank you sir and i'll be speaking regarding the intro tips for success which most of our previous speakers have already covered i'll just give you four or five tips which i felt will be slightly different from what we know of usually the first step is articular fractures depends upon congruity stability and alignment proximal tibia is slightly different you see the amount of stability and alignment which is required articular congruity remains the equal but the alignment and the stability becomes more important in the knee as compared to others so remember that alignment in a type 5 and a type 6 fracture becomes paramount in intraoperative reduction keep this principle in mind whenever you are treating a proximal tibial fracture so 
Do not have the second X-ray. Have the first X-ray to have your alignment. The tip to it is most of your implants should be parallel to the proximal tibia or the joint line. They will have one central screw which is parallel to it just in distal femur, the same way as in proximal tibia. See it on the opposite side. If you put in the plate which is thick in a different way, you might have a varus which will lead to loss and lack of alignment, which will lead to early arthritis, which may not have happened even if you had some amount of articular incongruity. So think about these two things whenever you are treating that. Now coming to a specific fracture patterns and what we can do. There is a split depression, the most common fracture pattern which we used to see 10 years back, not nowadays because most of the high traffic is causing some other things. You can see the amount of depression. So what we do, keep your KYS set, I use a lot of KYS so I will be uh, say with that only. Lift up by opening or by a window or the fracture, lift up your depressed fragment way below, just like in calcaneum or we do it in other fracture patterns. Do not clamp before you lift up this depression. That's the first tip which I would like for the youngsters out here. Do not clamp before you lift up because if you clamp before, the space for that depressed fragment is not going to come up. It will always remain down. That's the trap door effect which happens if you clamp it before. So lift up your fragment and then clamp to ensure that your depression is anatomically reduced. You do it, once you reduce it, I have put in the KYS in the front, I have extended them and then the clamp is put to take care of your widening. Do not put in the clamp before you depress, lift up the depressed fragment. And then you put in your bone grafts as well as the raft plates which were told to you and you can get an excellent anatomical congruity in a depressed fracture. If your fragment or the lateral wall where you want to put in the clamp is very small, very thin and the entire fragment has depressed, what to do? Here is the place where you can put in a plate first without the depression being lifted up. Fix the plate lower down with a K-wire or a screw, not in the depression area but lower down in the diaphyseal area. That will act as your lateral column. And now if you want to lift up your depressed fragment, you can hammer it up and lift that up properly if you are not able to get that. And that's a new tip or a different tip which you can use. Put in a plate acting as a lateral buttress where you can hammer in your ball tip or whatever you are lifting with the punch and the depressed fragment can be lifted against a fragment so that you know that it is not going to go wide. And then once you have lifted it up, you put in your wires, put in the screws and the bone grafts the way you want them and then you can clamp and put in your plate properly as accordingly. So make up your lateral column along with a plate if your fragment is very flimsy on the lateral side. Then we come to the type 4 ones which are the horrible fracture dislocations. Always look for vascularity, always look for neural problems before you go intraop. So let's say a fracture pattern very common like this where the lateral condyle has gone up and the medial side is okay. We have to look for reduction part, look for meniscus entrapments because meniscus, lateral meniscus is usually entrapped here and whatever you might do it will not come in. So. Once you reduce and you are able to reduce, then you put in your clamps. I normally put in a K wires. As he said, Dr. Shahani, regarding the fracture patterns, decide on the CT scan, do it in prone position for me, acts as a volar button or a lateral side, and then you can put in your lag screws and putting in the plate at the apex side. And that's how you can get excellent reduction, not the widening of the tibial flares, two lag screws and a posterior plate, and excellent results. The other tip for this in a similar sort of a fracture is you try to put in the clamps to reduce this many a times and these clamps do not get a proper hold. So once you have this fracture pattern, do it this way that you put in your clamp on the lateral condyle and the medial clamp of it or the tine of it is not going on to the medial side of the tibia, it is going on to the medial femoral side. The vector forces by which you put in this clamp is able to reduce your lateral condyle lower down and it becomes very easy to reduce it. Try this, I will tell you 
you will find it very useful, especially in such cases which come quite late to us many a times and the medial or the tibial flare we are not able to correct because it's widened. Then you use it to the tine on the lateral side and the medial femoral condyle, clamp them in this vector and your results will be better off. And then depending upon that, you can put in the plates, medial, posteromedial, anteromedial, wherever you want and you can get excellent anatomical congruity with this without much hassle intraoperatively. Then always look for anteromedial compressions. These are the anteromedial compressions which are coming up, the so-called hyperextension injuries. Very common nowadays, you will find especially in ladies coming in around 30-40 hyperextension injuries, look for lateral fibular play, fix, fracture or injuries. They usually have a ligamentous disruption of the FCL or the LCLs. So you need to take care of that. Oops, what happened? They got deno... <laughs> I don't know what has happened in the photographs. So we have reduced them and in this condyle which was there on the anterior side, a rim plate on the medial side has been put just as a rim plate so that we are able to hold the anteromedial depression of it along with the fibular fixation because ligamentous instability is also a stability of the tibial condyle is very important as compared to the articular ones. Coming to the bicondyle, I'll just take one or two minutes, sir, if you permit. The dual approach was said, medial fractures should be reduced first, plates depending upon that. Why do you want to reduce medial is? Because medial is comminuted less, so you can maintain the length. If lateral is comminuted less, fix the lateral one. If the medial one is more comminuted. You want to fix the less comminuted one. <laughs> like in this, the combination is less on medial side, more on the lateral side. Medial fixation stability has been achieved. Then the reduction of the lateral depressions has been done. K wires have been put and then you get your reduction which the way you want it. In type 5 and type 6 fractures, when you have a bicondylar fracture going into the tibial extensions, diaphyseal areas, he was a 50 year old male paramilitary person. Look at the CT scans, medially is big chunk but displaced, laterally is a huge combination and comminuted centrally area. Always look for soft tissues, they are going to decide you in drop. But don't worry, these usually heal, take some time, three weeks, two weeks, but they will heal. And the same situations, these are the same photographs, you can see how they heal over a period of time when they are taken for interop interventions. Intervention remains the same, but in a minimally invasive way as much as possible. You put in long plates, biological bridging plates, so that you are able to maintain the alignment properly while maintaining the articular congruity to the best of your ability because alignment is more important in tibial fractures. Maintain that and you can see on the lateral side how small incisions have been able to be putting a long plate out there, maintaining the congruity with medial plate first. Post-op images, three, five months follow-up, 15 months follow-up and these are the patient, the same blisters, the same scarring on the skin but the results you get are optimal. If you remember how to maintain the alignment with no pain. So finally take home, Alignment is equally important in tibia as articular reduction is. Always remember that. Avoid the trapdoor effects in joint depression types. In bicondylar fractures, usually the medial side needs to be lifted because it is less comminuted. Understand the fracture pattern to decide the various approaches told by Dr. Tushar or how do you want to access the medial or the lateral in posterior prone positions. Look out for this new type of injury which is coming in, the hyperextension, the so-called compression of the anteromedial side and look for ligamentous disruptions in such cases. They are going to give you the stability. Thank you. Thank you, sir. May I invite Dr. Raju Chaudhary to deliver his last lecture of this session. Uh, the last lecture and it said delayed dreaded presentations but once you have the proper knowledge the word dreaded goes away so it's going to be very interesting to see how to take the dreadedness away from a delayed presentation while the while the understanding of these fractures has increased exponentially this has led to accept things that were previously 
that were previously not possible to to repair and when i was thinking about it i thought what is a delayed presentation and i could only think of uh, there's no mention in literature 3 3 weeks 6 weeks 8 weeks 2 years so i said when reduction becomes extremely difficult and needs special skills so let's see this case of a 45 year old lady and this looks like a very straightforward fracture and 8 weeks after injury you see the medial side shows collapse and this has been elevated repaired bone grafted and that's your final result so that's a delayed presentation so when you approach this you should study you should have all the four views ap lateral the oblique views as well despite the fact you are going to have a scanogram you are going to have a ct scan and also at times not always a mri scan now on these pictures imaging you look out for your extra articular alignment and the articular congruity again go into the details if there is any incongruity look at the slope on your lateral view and look for widening so if you are looking for these five things that should help you plan out your your approach your tactic your implants and what other things you would need so that reminds me of a story of willie sutton who was a bank robber in the 1930s after about 120 bank robberies he was finally caught and when he was caught the police asked him why did you rob banks rob, uh, willie and he said that is where the money is this is exactly the way you should choose your approach where is the problem very beautifully the approach has been told by tushar by sachin and everyone else but i would like to add two or three extra tips when you are doing your lateral condyle even the supra fibular approach or the extended approach gives you about 70% of exposure of the articular surface you can't go further medial in such situations i do what i call fracturoscopy so i take a arthroscope there is no water inside i put the arthroscope inside stretch the knee out so i can see more medially and for the absolute posterior rim i occasionally use the dental mirror i autoclave a dental mirror and i just pass it posteriorly so i can see the posterior surface properly the other technique is pushing the lateral meniscus inside so just like you do a submeniscal arthrotomy lifting up the meniscus on the on the lateral side you you release the the meniscus totally leave the horns intact and you push the whole meniscus inside you can see almost 95% of the articular surface so those would be two or three tips if you want to have a look more so another coming to a case 50 year old lady fell off the activa getting late so we get a ct scan we can see there is some delayed union some non union there is uh, so the planning goes that you see what is the amount of angulation that is the amount of graft that you will require you look for the articular congruity you look at the the sagittal plane the incision i have kept i always keep the pes intact although you can cut the pes and then repair it at the end finally you can see the osteotome going intraarticular now i usually put two uh, osteotomes and then keeping one below and lifting the whole thing up temporarily hold it with the wires as you can see on your left hand side pick cm image and finally bone grafting and fixing a plate now when we are talking i mean very interestingly and very importantly um, uh, vivek said that the alignment is very important as a rule for all tibial condyle fractures even the fresh ones i would um, 
ask everyone to take a new year resolution that they would do a cord test or something to make sure they, because it is a common complication that we see that the alignment has not been maintained. So that's another patient again and I'll just run through because it's almost an identical holding of the K-wire, putting in a bone graft, that's the final result. Now we come to the lateral condyle non-union and this is the central part. Now in this situation something has happened, okay. So what is done is that if you will see here, I'll try to mark it with an arrow. So you do an osteotomy here. The osteotomy has been done on the, on the black line and then you lift the whole blue part, that is the depressed part, up with a punch, bone graft it and then put it put in the bone graft and fix it. The, another patient and there is a, an, the reversal of slope. Again, if you have studied this x-ray and the scans properly, you can see there is a varus collapse, there is a reversal of scope, slope. This is one of the hyperextension type of injuries and here again, if, once you have studied the whole thing, you take your osteotom through the um, through the original fracture site, you can see it has been elevated, fixed temporary with the wire and a tricortical graft has been put in. In this situation, we required to put two plates, so it's not that just one plate would be adequate, depends, and that is the final picture. Now, widening of the tibial condyle. Now, this is a problem that everyone gets tense and worried. How will you, because what I have done here today is only talk of individual deformities, um, but there, very rarely you get these individuals. Most of them have two or three things combined. You have got a varus deformity, widening of condyle, everything together. So we'll just go through this particular uh, widening. So this was fixed elsewhere. There's incongruity of the joint surface, widening of the con condyle that is very clearly seen, and wedge osteotom, that's your normal side above. So on the normal side, I make a wedge-like thing and this has been removed, closed and fixed. So to the take home is, analyze the deformity radiologically for congruity and mechanical axis. Map the intraarticular incongruity to decide the approach. Um, one or two uh, newer things that I have added is pushing the medial meniscus. So this would be sequential. If you can see it with, with a dental mirror, or if you can see it with the, with the arthroscope, which I call an ar fracturoscope, then you don't have to do pushing in the meniscus completely inside. So it is a sequential way of extending your, ex your approach. You should plan your extra instruments, your implants, your bone grafts, etc. Mobilize early, but if there is a problem, please do not hesitate to take help. Thank you. Thank you, sir. We can have a few questions. My first question to Tushar, what is your opinion regarding dual approach? Dual approach when you need, sir, when you need and if you place the incision properly, it is one of the best approach. But the planning of the incision has to be because the interval between the two incisions is very critical. Any more questions to any yeah. esteemed faculty? Yes, sir. One question. Yes, Mugi, sir. When there is an ACL and a PCL avulsion with the bone fragment, nobody has talked about that. That's what I want to tell. You have to take a lasso stitch to pull it and fix that ACL and PCL with the bone. Otherwise, it will be delayed. What is your opinion? I think Dr. Vivek Trikha will be the best person to answer this yeah. question. And second, when you put the raft screw, is there a need for a bone graft? Then why put a raft screw? Okay. So there are two questions. The first one regarding the ACL and the PCLs. If the PCL is there or the ACL with bony avulsions are there and we can reduce it anatomically, I will do that with a K-wire or fix them with lassos as you said. It's not so easy as you say, sir. It might be so easy in your hands to put in the lasso and then put in. But otherwise, it's not so easy. 
But if you do not fix them also, I can assure you that many of them with the bony avulsions, they are not widely displaced. If they are less displaced from less than 5 millimeters, they usually unite and do not have much major stability issues. As regards the raft screw and the bone grafts, I normally would like to put in the bone grafts because what we see the depression is not exactly a small in a two-dimensional area. It is a huge three-dimensional if you see in the actual axial scans. How and when you are able to ensure that your raft screws are going and holding that entire articular area completely, then only you can go and with, with, do not do a bone grafting. However, if your one or two screws are there and they are holding it just like we do it in a dongling now or a boat, you might be falling down into the pond, which we do not want the depression to be. Thank you. And do you use an external fixator to distract on the table? No. I usually do it with the traction or a upper tib uh, lower tibial pins, but we normally in such cases, if they are having some soft issues or a swelling, we normally put them on an external fixator right in the beginning and then only take them later on in the surgery when the swelling has reduced or the blisters have improved and our reduction has been maintained. Thank you. Any further questions? Good evening, sirs. I have a question, sir. So, uh, whenever we encounter any patient of high uh, t velocity trauma, say he's having a type 4, 5 or 6 uh, injury, should we order MRI? Along with the X-rays or do we have a protocol key? We have to wait for some time or MRIs are not indicated every time. Dr. Sachin Bhosle, would like to answer this question. Hello. Uh, yes, uh, Shatsker type 5 and 6 injury is better to do MRI because you will find much more than what you suspected. Uh, ACL, PCL avulsions, especially MCL rupture uh, is easy to miss and then have problems. Thank you, sir. Uh, Dr. Mukhi, <laughs> Dr. Mukhi, uh, the external fixator has a problem with intraoperatively if you are trying to fix posteriorly. In the, in the, uh, in the postural lateral portion, you want to flex the knee so the soft tissue is relaxed and you can go posteriorly and see better. One more question. I always do arthroscopy also. This was put lately and lastly by my Surat friend. I appreciate that. Put an arthroscope. We are in mini days, mini invasive. Put an arthroscope and see how your articular alignment is post-operatively or during the operation. That will give you immense help. Sir, what is the question? That is a comment. Comment. <laughs> My question to Dr. Sachin, in cases of high velocity trauma, there is a massive swelling. How long you wait and when you intervene exactly? Uh, the two types of such patients, uh, those who unfortunately are not too badly displaced and uh, one can perhaps put them on an Elizarov and get the articular congruity right using few screws. But always it's not such a lucky scenario that there can be a three or four colon disruptions with a huge swelling, with huge amount of blisters. So I tend to put them on an external fixator, spanning the knee joint right at the start and then wait as long as it is required uh, for the swelling to settle down when the fixator can be removed and definitive fixation can be taken up. Means uh, whatever reduction you done with closed reduction, that so you I will think, accept or you will... No, no, I think it is important, especially if you have what is like the condyles have gone wide or spread out. Don't just, just don't apply the external fixator. You need to reduce the articular surface because otherwise that swelling is going to take a long time to settle down. So just that articular surface, you have to get your condyles reduced. Good evening, sir. Uh, sir, even in type 4, type 5 fracture, we get an MRI done and uh, during an MRI we find ACL or PCL is avulsed. Can we uh, do the surgery in the, on the same setting or we wait for some time and do the ACL surgery afterwards? See, if you have such a comminuted fracture 
and if you want to do acl pcl reconstruction we are not talking about bony avulsions bony avulsions as dr trika just said maybe you can put a lasso maybe you can put in a screw if you have a mid substance tear which you are asking now you have already put in your plates you want to drill tunnels for your tibia uh, acl and pcl reconstruction you are creating a more fracture there most of these will not have the kind of instability once they've healed if they are unstable you can assess them or do this later on just get your bony architecture restored don't try to do everything at the same go and sir uh, if acl and pcr are avulsed that uh, won't hamper the uh, results afterwards those avulsed parts if acl and pcl are avulsed so that is what dr trika just said most of the time if it is not uh, significantly displaced they will still heal if you have a large enough piece either fix it or put in a lasso stitch yes i think uh, here we conclude our session by thanking our esteemed chairperson dr eknath pawar sir and dr subhash divre sir and all the esteemed faculty thank you bombay orthopedic society for giving us the opportunity and thank you all the delegates for patient and interactive listening